team is, is more inevitable. And uh, I know you like snorkeling. Uh, right. So, uh, you know, so let's not get too deep. But if you could take about 10 to 15 minutes to lay out uh, the situation, right. uh, especially the lessons that we in Asia should be learning from what happened in Europe or what's happening right. and unfolding in Europe. Uh, and, uh, you know, the floor is yours. No. Well, um, I make a living uh, advising governments on strategy. Strategy is the logic of war and the logic of peace. And uh, the problem is that the logic of war is contradictory. In everything we do, we want to be logical. If you're hungry, you eat, etc. Only in war, everything becomes the opposite. Uh, Mr. Putin looked at NATO. NATO is a military alliance. And it is an alliance which has been weaker and weaker and weaker because a military alliance is against an enemy. Soviet Union ended, and so NATO became weaker and weaker. They still met, they still did that, and had exercises, but everything was becoming like a theatrical performance. It wasn't serious. You know, they had these sessions and so on. Now, Putin attacks Ukraine. Suddenly, NATO becomes strong because Putin provided NATO with the only thing it didn't have. NATO has hundreds of millions of people, all kinds of stuff. The one thing they didn't have was an enemy threatening them. So Putin provides it. The moment he attacks NATO, which was so weak, too weak to deter him. NATO was so weak that he wasn't afraid, so he attacked. The moment he attacked, NATO becomes strong. Uh, countries that are not in NATO, like Australia, join NATO immediately. Without big talks, negotiations, they put armored cars on airplanes and sent them 13,000 miles to Ukraine. Uh, the J government of Japan sent, and Sweden, before talking about joining NATO, which they did, uh, they started sending supplies to, to Ukraine. And so did countries all around the place. So the Ukrainians, uh, now, if Mr. Putin is sitting here and you all sh shout to him, how could you do such a stupid thing and so on and so forth, he would tell you the following thing. First, the Central Intelligence Agency declared that if I start a war, Zelensky, who is a comedian, a comed he will run away, the government will dissolve, left without orders, the Ukrainian army will not fight. That is, was the CIA estimate. That's why they pressed Biden, President Biden, to offer evacuation to Zelensky. Because he's going to run away. Why did you help him run away? And so on. Uh, a week before all the last American diplomats left Kiev, abandoned Kiev. Why? Because the Russians will conquer Kiev in 24 hours. Once the Americans left, all the other, most of the other diplomats also left. So if the Ukrainians were sensitive, to opinion, they would be demoralized and afraid. Now, the fact that the Russian intelligence service, the FSB, the internal service, told Putin that if he invades, Zelensky will run away, the government will dissolve, left without orders, the Ukrainians don't fight. Exactly the same thing as the CIA. Why? Because they were thinking in linear logic. They didn't realize that war changes everything right away, right away. It makes the weak strong, and the strong, the ones who are, uh, the moment you start a war, they dissolve and become weak. That's how things work in strategy, right? Now, the second problem he had was at a different level of strategy, which is that Ukraine is a very small country compared to Russia. However, it is Europe's biggest country, biggest country, and about five times bigger than Czechoslovakia. In 1968, the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia with 800,000 troops. Czechoslovakia is a long, narrow country, easily invadable from the north and south. And here, they invade Ukraine with 135,000 troops, including army dentists, OK? They're a very small army. Why? Because the moment they're going to invade, there's going to be information warfare. It's going to be fourth generation warfare. All these wonderful things. 
And the Russian generals, like the American generals, have not fought a real war against patriotic Europeans with guns. Wars fought against patriotic Europeans with guns last several years and millions died. They forgot that. All these generals with their medals and everything had never been in a real war. I, I was in three little wars. I, I lift, picked up a rifle. I shot, actually killed somebody. I was helmet in my study. The generals at the meetings, none of them have been in a real war. They were in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, where you have sectarian people shouting and stuff, but they don't have real fighters. And stuff. So Putin can say, excuse me, don't blame me. Uh, I wasn't just following my people. I was following the CIA, all these other people. Now, the Germans heard the CIA, and therefore what the Germans did, they announced before the war, we will not supply weapons to Ukraine. We won't let the Royal Air Force overfly Germany to bring weapons to Ukraine and we will not stop Nord Stream 2. So basically, the Germans put big green lines to Putin saying, invade, invade. We won't react. They said that before the war. So poor Putin can defend himself. He says, this was a global conspiracy against me, Vladimir Putin, to persuade me to invade Ukraine. Okay? Now, that is how strategy works. The reason why the history of war is a history of follies, stupidities, and crimes is because of strategy. Now, what does the Russians have, having made the mistake of starting a war without declaring war, without mobilizing the army, without having an army, this 130,000 people invading Europe's biggest country? No chance. They've been trying to catch up ever since. Now, what do the Russians have? Well, at the level of grand strategy, not tactics, not what happens in the battlefield today or tomorrow, they have the following. They have the world's biggest country, and the world's biggest country reaches many parts of the world without going anywhere. They're in the Far East, they're in the Middle East, they're in Europe, everywhere else because the world's biggest country. That they still have, and they haven't lost it, and they will not lose it. Secondly, they are producing all their own food, all their own food, and all their own energy. They don't import oil and, and LNG like China does, they don't, they have their own, and they don't import food. When Russia goes to war and you put all the sanctions against Russia, that means that in Moscow you cannot buy Louis Vuitton handbags, right? Except you can via Istanbul, and actually they discovered this cheaper because the Turkish merchants took less profit margin than the Russian ones. So actually, Louis Vuitton handbags are cheaper today than they were before. But food and energy they have. I know some other countries in the world which are talking about war. 82nd-year-old woman, a very nice woman in Washington, her first name is Nancy, decides she wants to visit Taiwan. So suddenly, Global Times says, it's going to be war, it's going to be war. And our sinologists, our China experts, and the main characteristic of a China expert is he should not know Chinese, he should not know Potonghua, and should never be to China except for short visits to Beijing for big conferences. Okay, our China experts said if Nancy Pelosi goes to Taiwan, there's going to be war, right? And uh, then, of course, we had all these other voices and so on. And Global Times started talking about it, and Mr. Xi Jinping, who is a very good player, made one mistake. He didn't stop the Global Times machine to talk about as if China were actually capable of fighting a war. Now, you would think that China should be capable of fighting war. After all, it's a, not a big, it's a very big country and all that stuff. But it, if you look at history, you will find that the, there have always been a very small number of countries capable of actually going to war. And it didn't matter how many ships and tanks they had, they were not capable of going to war. When it did go to war, they failed. They failed. And, uh, you know, 1938, Italy had the biggest navy in the Mediterranean and all kinds of stuff. The fighting starts, everything disintegrates and disappears. Now, we cannot rely on this. The fact that you tell uh, Tommy, don't go to the bar tonight and drive, doesn't mean, and Tommy understands, it's not, it doesn't mean Tommy will not go. Okay? So, does Mr. Xi Jinping know that in 2021, last year, China imported 95 million 
metric tons of soya beans to feed pigs and chickens and everything else in China. The moment you don't bring this 95 million metric tons, by the way, is the biggest movement of goods on the world's ocean to bring protein to China. Now, when I lived in Beijing in 1976, Mao died on me while I was living in Beijing. At that time, if nobody was starving in Beijing. People were a little thin, maybe. And everybody was eating rice, wheat, vegetables, and so on. Today's Chinese have changed, physically, physiologically changed. So much so that in, in Shanghai lockdown, in the Shanghai lockdown, they provided plenty of food to the people in lockdown, but they said they were starving. Starving because they didn't have uh, cheese, yogurt, things like that. They didn't exist in China at all. And they didn't have fresh meat and all these other things. So the question <coughs> is, does Xi Jinping know this? Does he know that the moment he starts a war, without blockades, without warships, without the Seventh Fleet or any fleet, suddenly there'll be no protein entering China. So they have to, within three months, they have to kill all their pigs or at least 80% of the pigs and chicken people will eat a lot of meat, no meat. Now, if Putin had started the war on February 23rd, which he did, and by July there was no protein in Russia, I don't believe the situation would be so great. Okay? And then the other thing is this. As you know, human history is full of wars, full of wars. But there's one kind of war that does not exist in human history, a war fought by armies of single boys. Uh, wars fought by single people. Wars were always fought with the spare male children. You have four boys, one of them takes your land, another marries a girl with some land, a third one can do this. The fourth one, if he goes to the army, or the third one goes to the army and doesn't come back, it's very sad, but and so on. Now, does Xi Jinping know that? That, I think he knows, because in 2020, up in Ladakh, in a very beautiful place, by the way, I visited just recently, Galwan Valley at 4,270 meters, there was a fight between Chinese and Indians. Some Indians died. They were, the, the army gave them to the families, they had funerals, and the funerals were advertised. On the Chinese side, there was silence about people dying. Eight months later, eight months later, they announced that four people had died. But that time, they prepared full-scale video biographies and all that kind of stuff. So it means that somebody in Beijing was aware of the fact that having four dead, four dead was the loss. Now, the issue is how many dead there would be if there's a war here. Well, remember what happens, Finland is neutral, Finland stops being neutral the moment they attack Ukraine. You would think that the seeing Russians <coughs> attack Ukraine, the Finlands say, we are neutral, we are neutral, don't attack us, they did the opposite. They did the opposite, they said, we are joining NATO. When the Russian threatened Finland, the Chief of Staff of the Finnish Army, done some journalist or somebody, said, we have 50,000 Russians buried in Finland from your last war. We have room for many more. So first point about this. China moves, and you countries will not behave according to common sense logic. Instead of staying out of the way, the Japanese, instead of saying, well, you know, we're not really involved, it's not really us, the Japanese are going to send us submarines into action and the submarines will go and they start sinking Chinese ships. They don't care about it. That's how they're going to respond. I believe that different countries around Asia will respond in that way as the Finns and Swedes did, with two exceptions. One exception, of course, is Korea. The Koreans are our allies in peacetime. The Koreans are not our allies if there's a war. They will not participate. They will announce neutrality. If anybody who knows Koreans would know that, okay? Uh, we, con we, we are their allies, but they're not our allies. But everybody else is going to do it. The Australians, of course, will overcommit and do more than their numbers. And there's going to be, and the thing is, you're going to have the French Navy sending nuclear attack submarines all right here outside Singapore. And the British will send nuclear attack submarines. So the Chinese will attack, let's say, Taiwan, and they find themselves dealing with 17 different countries hitting them in different ways. That is, the question is, does Xi Jinping know this? Does he know it? Now, you would think that the head of a government knows a lot, but we discovered recently that heads of government know less than casual tourists. Uh, George Bush, 
Bush II believed that if you remove Saddam Hussein, there will be democracy. You take away the horrible dictator, democracy. He discovered that Saddam Hussein was doing a good job of keeping the, the Kurds and the Turkmen and the Arabs and the Sinai and the Shia <coughs> from each other. They, did, they were wrong. They thought he was an evil dictator. Actually, the poor man was trying to keep a country together. So does Xi Jinping know anything about foreign affairs? So if he's like George Bush Sr., if he's like Putin, and if he's like Biden, who believed the generals, these bemedaled generals, you know, uh, who appear on CNN and so on, the good-looking, who told him that Kabul would resist for two years without any help at all. That's what put, uh, Biden was told. So if Xi Jinping is as well-informed as Biden, Putin, and so on and so forth, he probably thinks that the Chinese are a heroic, war-winning people. And he overlooks Chinese history, the fact that uh, except for about 300 years, in the last 2,000 years, China has been ruled by foreigners. Three guys on horseback who arrived, defeated the Chinese armies, and created dynasties in the last two centuries. Probably Xi Jinping doesn't know that. He probably believes that China, Chinese are really a great fighting people. That, so every time I listen to a speech of Xi Jinping, and I do listen, and I'm just not read the text, I hear Mussolini. Mussolini actually believed that the Italians were fighting people. Fighting people, you know, Romans, Italians. So if Xi Jinping is a normal leader, like Putin, like that, he does not realize that China cannot, in fact, fight a war. And if China does fight the war, that it will lose. And it will lose very badly and very quickly. As I say, the first thing that will happen, the Japanese will send their submarines. Their submarines are pretty good. And the, the Japanese submariners have been living their entire life to this moment to be able to go out and sink every ship of the PLA Navy that's worthy of a torpedo. Japanese torpedoes are very expensive, so a lot of ships will not be attacked because they're not worthy of a Japanese torpedo. So that is the scenario we're facing. So I will now <coughs> ask you a question, which is, is this guy, Xi Jinping, who is so different than Hu Jintao? Hu Jintao struggled to bring Chinese government in a more humane direction. And when there was the earthquake in Shutuan, Wen Jiabao went there wearing just simple trousers and like a working class shirt and sat with the parents. Hu Jintao himself, was fallible. <coughs> he said, you know, uh, we make mistakes and things like that. We make mistakes. Now we have the infallible one. The question is, is he going to be like Biden and Bush, you know, and, all, I mean, uh, and uh, Putin? Mm. Uh, will it be? Is he a barker, barker or a biter? What That's do you think? Question. No, I'm asking you. No, Excuse uh, me. You, you think. You, first of all, you live closer to Beijing than I do. I okay. mean, uh, no, no, but no, you live there, there, you travel well, there. So, but do you think war is inevitable in Asia, or do you think it can be avoided? Okay, so the, if states were organized on functional lines, mm -hmm. right, uh, that, let's say economic and so on, but the states are organized on spatial, spatial sure. basis, space. Because they are spatial, the natural tendency of state as a human organization, mm -hmm. like you organize a banking group, okay? A banking group will move from London to New York to Zurich to Singapore, Hong Kong, you know, doing their banking, okay? But states are territorial. Our lives are less and less territorial. You know, people like you travel all over the world. Even I have gone to a few countries and so on. We, we are less and less territorial. States are entirely territorial. And every state is convinced of its logic. For example, I just heard a very distinguished, very clever person explaining how Singapore will avoid the problems of everybody else because we are Singapore, we're more efficient, more effective. Mm -hmm. The fact is, I walk around Singapore, I see people with their iPhones walk, walking into traffic. Right. Every moment. Okay? So states are, we have to live with. I work, states are my clients. I have no private clients. I work for US government, allied governments, uh, you know, the sure. main ones. And I'm dealing with them, these animals, all the time. And their, their capacity to make mistakes mm -hmm. is the same as yours and mine. Mm -hmm. Except when we, we <coughs> make a mistake, right. okay, we have a self-corrective mechanism. For example, I like drinking, but right. if I drink too much, I fall, so I don't drink so much. But states don't have the mechanism. So, so, so the, the answer is that if you are studying uh, this uh, human race and so on, 
you must not anticipate anything. But there are things one could do. Okay. There are things. <coughs> And one of the things that people can do is to have a higher level of national awareness of international reality, right? Okay. And uh, by adopting certain means of communication. So if you look, look around the world, you will encounter some populations that are dramatically better informed than others, which is, for example, ordinary Swiss people, very ordinary Swiss people, not particularly educated at all or anything else, a very high level of sensitivity to what's happening in the surrounding areas. Mm -hmm. They know what's happening in France, in Italy, in Germany, and so on. The Swiss government is fed with this knowledge. So there's ability of awareness, okay? Another example is Israel. Because Israeli history, the Jewish history, the Jews coming everywhere, the normal level of information of the Israeli state is extremely high. They know what's going on in Malaysia, for example, and things like that. So you, information need not turn this all into a crowd, right? Mm -hmm. What the lady was talking about is how these media turn people into a crowd with the crowd dynamics and craziness of crowds, you know, eat a one, eat a one. You turn Koreans into a crowd, you get eat a one. Sure. Right? So there are some, you know, remedies and so on, but you know, pessimism and so on. On the other hand, war is fun. I took no. part in three wars. I enjoyed them very much, I have to say. Uh, war is fun, and that's another consideration. Dr. Lutwerk, you took a big swing at the PLA by saying the uh, army of single boys. Single boys. <coughs> no, not a big swing. I just yeah. note that they lost four people killed, they no, say. No, no, but... And it but took them eight months to acknowledge... Your own military, people. the U.S. military... Yes. You sit on 140 golf courses on bases worldwide. Yes. You go into the chat rooms of the South Korean uh, army people, and the biggest concern there is the quality of the suntan lotion that is issued to them. And that's the biggest chat point. Well, your then, military, your yeah, military, yeah. as well as the Taiwanese military, you're having problems conscripting people. Well, the Taiwanese military don't have a problem conscripting people. The Taiwanese military are run by Guomintang generals. Doesn't matter. Who love medals. It, medals, sure, sure, medals it doesn't matter. And who but have no intention to you of is fighting this. one day. My question right? to you is this. It doesn't yeah. matter whether yeah. they're single boy yeah, military the or okay. not. No, no, listen. Yeah. The first thing My happens, point is, yeah, yeah. is, are we today in an era of standoff wars and cyber? How important is oh, cyber, cyber in conflict? And finally, you know, I tracked the movements of uh, Admiral Aquilino around the region, and he's been spending a lot of time on space facilities. Space facilities. Yes. Could you give us a sense, is the next war likely to be fought in cyber and in space, and does that even the score with the Americans? With in you? other words, we can all stay on the beach, relax, while up there... No, no, no I'm not saying it's entirely there, but... Uh, all right, le let me say this, okay? Uh, army fighting, ground fighting, like I did as an infantryman, that kind of stuff doesn't really appeal to Chinese people, mm -hmm. culturally speaking. Mm -hmm. And Navy uh, could be interesting, but they're very new at it. And after you, you built a warship, it takes you 30 years mm -hmm. to develop capability. Mm -hmm. So they're not ready for that. In aviation, they run against the problem of uh, research and development in a post-Mao nihilist society, mm -hmm. where it's very difficult to put teams together, scientists, engineers, so they can't really get jet engines done in China. So, so in the air, they're weak, right? At Navy, they're weak. Army, they're weak. But we have created ourselves the only domain where Chinese can win, cyber domain. So they can. Cyber domain. Okay. Now, except that if somebody tries to use the cyber domain, the first thing that happens is that people will abandon the cyber domain they'll go, go back to high frequency radio, and so on. Some people are ready for the cyber mm -hmm. war, and I'm one of them, this is my phone. Mm -hmm. I've never owned a smartphone because I deal with uh, secret matters, and, and I was briefed 15 years ago, mm -hmm. 15 years ago on the, in, on the fact that they were able to recompose fragments of information, they could switch on your phone without you knowing it, and they could use fragmentary information then 15 years ago with artificial intelligence at the beginning, which was, you know. Sure. So, you know, we are in an environment in which 
that technology is impacting on different people at a very different level. The fact that the American admirals are talking about satellites and space and cyber is very interesting for me because they are failing to train the sailors properly. We had a fire in San Diego aboard a billion dollar amphibious assault vessel and the crew were unable to stop the fire. The vessel was irreparably lost, mm -hmm. okay? So the guys, they talk about space and cyber while failing to the, why is that? Because it's called peacetime. Mm -hmm. Peacetime is a disease for armed forces. Peacetime, because in peacetime you dream and fantasize that you have this capability and that capability, and that is what's going on. In reality, cyber war will play a very small role if there's conflict. I, uh, I know this because the chief cyber warrior in the US told me the cyber is the civilians are enthusiastic about it because they think there's gonna be war and peace while you're still relaxing in your you know in your <coughs> bathroom. Uh, right. You can win the war, but in reality they expect very yeah. little from it. Yeah. What right. they expect is shutdown, shutdown, right. which is everybody else going and buying these telephones, which in Singapore they're very hard to buy, by the way. Yeah. Even Filipino maids longer want this type uh, of stuff. Just give me a second. Uh, there is a facility for the audience to ask questions, and I think you can use the uh, uh, QR code and uh, use it uh, through that. Uh, Dr. Lutwak, I wanted to ask you something else. We see uh, uh, several uh, Asian states are beginning to work with NATO a little bit on certain uh, you know, domains. Is it NATO's interest to push so far east that you'll end up in our shores? It wasn't until very recently. So now it is. Now it is, because even the German government very reluctantly said that they would join. The British, of course, were there when they, they developed the Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier, was exclusively to be used in the Pacific. Right. Exclusively. Uh, the French are very eager to be here, as you know, they've been present and so on. Uh, and they're both declining powers, declining powers. The British and the French, very much declining powers. The only lesson is that the moment there's a war, the very declining power gives you more trouble than you expect uh, because the, all their residual capabilities are there. So yes, NATO as an organization will not come so quickly because some members of NATO will definitely say no to the last minute. Because they, you know, uh, for very, you know, in Italy, for example, three former prime ministers are full-time agents of the People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. So in Italy, there's a lot of reluctance. Italy was the only country that signed on to the Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the only one. Why? Why Italy? You know. So, yeah. so morning, some will not, yeah. but the important members of NATO will, sure. and the reluctantly, even the Germans. This morning, the Straits Times uh, reported that you're putting uh, B-52 uh, uh, stratofortresses in Australia, you know, which yes. follows the ones in Guam. Right. What are you from Guam? Yeah. They've no. been sitting in Guam. No. Are they moving from no, no, Guam? No, no, no. They're not moving. They're, they're, they were in Guam. Yeah. They are moving. They are sending what, new ones to what Australia. What are you intending to do here? Well, what they intend to do is the following: the B-52 is older than your grandfather, right? But it's a great big aeroplane full of electronics, but it can deliver uh, as many air-to-ground cruise missiles, precision long-range cruise missiles, as several squadrons of modern aircraft, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is that, that uh, there are things happening, right? And uh, they will sally out from a very far place, like Australia, which is hard to get to, very hard to get to for an enemy, from Sally out a choice where they want and they're going to launch and sink ships. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a kind of a bit of a crowd attack on the sure. PLA Navy if there's a war. Right. Because the Australians, uh, the Japanese will be very unhappy of any ship destroyed by an air launch cruise missile sent from Australia. You know, uh, yeah. they would like to sink it with a torpedo. There's going to be a yeah. competition. Now, if you look at what's happened in Europe, uh, you have got your I would say a fairly huge strategic victory for the United States. I mean, you're not lost a single soldier there. Uh, you're not fired a single shot, but you're getting almost everything you wanted, including on the energy disruptions and everything else. What is your American strategy uh, in Asia? Is it something similar? Make somebody else fight? 
We stand behind you. Well, or, well, you know, no, what nobody. Is, what do you intend to look, do? the United States did not make anybody fight. The United States had the same estimate as Putin. Mm. They wanted to evacuate Zelensky because the Ukrainian governments wouldn't fight, etc., etc. They have no intentionality at all. It just happens that the military alliance becomes very weak if there's no enemy. And Russia provided a, a very good enemy, you know, doing not only attacks, the invasion, a few atrocities. They flew in a few atrocities and so on. So the, the Americans were advantaged because they are a great military power, far away, far mm -hmm. away, not exposed to attack, with a, and having put in decades of work, patient diplomatic work, to develop these relationships. And these relationships were activated by Mr. Putin. Right? So the chief strategist who makes America powerful is Putin. Right? The moment the Americans themselves try to make themselves powerful, like invade Iraq, they always fail. But when foreigners act, Americans are very strong. I mean, and, you know, the day before Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt could not persuade the US Congress to have even a minimum military service. And then the Imperial Japanese Navy provided President Roosevelt with national unity, right? Power is mass, mass, multiplied, cohesion, multiplied unity. So the Imperial Japanese Navy provided the Americans the only thing they didn't have, which is unity. And that moment, they crushed everybody else. So the, the, if you were, uh, uh, my advice to successive administrations on every issue was, don't do it. They want to make a declaration, don't say it. You want to do a military operation, don't do it. And because at that time, I get quickly thrown out. I was thrown out of the 2003 Iraq War decision-making group because I was against the war. Mm. I mean, like, we want to have a <coughs> war. Is this this guy, I went to testify before Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Mr. Biden was the chairman, and I said, don't invade Iraq. Don't invade Iraq. They will not explode in democracy. They'll start killing each other, and you'll, et cetera, et cetera. And I was thrown out of the administration group. I was working for, as a consultant. I was thrown out. Uh, but uh, this advice works for the Americans more than other people. Right. You know, more than other people. Who the hell would have gone to fight in Vietnam? Right. Ag you know, right. against the country, the most anti-Chinese country on the face of the earth. You fight in Vietnam to contain China, which is to say nobody involved had read even a 10-page booklet on mm -hmm. Vietnam. Mm -hmm. They knew nothing. Right. right? So you, it's you, you, called you, you, great state autism. Uh, great yeah. states are autistic. Great states are not aware of the outside world. And of course, China, unfortunately, is a very great state. Right? Autism, not being aware. Just remember, the Chinese quarrel with Japan over Senkaku began the day when there was the only neutralist-oriented prime minister, Naoto Kan, since 1945. The only neutralist prime minister, the Chinese, boom, we want Senkaku, we want Senkaku. Okay, so that's autistic. I want to behavior. wind up uh, yeah. with a final question to you. Uh, you're a great student of power. Of? of power. Military might, you know, strategy and everything else. But there's also I know something to shoot the rifle, OK? I Limit to that. Yes. Uh, but there's also something called influence. And do you see, despite your overwhelming power, that you are losing influence around the world, and particularly in this part of the world? And I mean, I'd say uh, uh, even in, in the Middle East. Right, OK, so uh, we are definitely losing influence. That's not a quarrel. But if you were uh, advising Xi Jinping, you would say the following thing. What, get what rid of the other side. No, no. Get rid the of the side? Chinese Navy. What get rid of the Chinese Navy, and the Filipinos will hand over the Philippines to China. Get rid of the Chinese Air Force, <coughs> and the Japanese will say, "Why do we have these American bases making noises overhead with helicopters?" So all the Chinese would have to do is to disarm. Mm -hmm. If they disarmed, it would be Chinese investment, Chinese market, Chinese tourism and they would definitely dominate Asia. Who the hell wants to have people uh, flying jets in, in Honshu, in Japan, making noise every morning and so on, if there's no Chinese Air Force? So influence, a country like China can have a dominating influence, and that is what Zhen Bijan, Zhen Bijan, who is my good friend of 
25 years, Jan Bizan went to Hainan Island and made a speech about peaceful rights, peaceful rights. He said, you know, what Jan Bizan told people, he's very thin, you know, he's very thin. He said, we are like fat man in an elevator. We're going to get bigger and bigger, and we're going to squeeze everybody against it. We have to tell them we are peaceful and so on. He was completely sincere. He wasn't cheating. He was totally sincere. But autism wins. Autism wins. Runaway horses. I went to see Jambi Jan after the Senkaku thing. I said, what's going on? And he said, a, J a Chinese two words, which I forget, called runaway, runaway horses. Lost control. Lost control. Because, of course, as you know, the Chinese government was highly misinformed about the 2009 financial crisis. Right. They believed it was the end of American capitalism. Right. You know, they believed that. So suddenly they changed, you know. Fu Yin, I was friendly with Fu Yin, then Vice Foreign Minister, the Mongol lady, beautiful woman and some. And suddenly she changed. She said, China up, America down. You know, before she was very soft and stuff. Right. So, you know. It's interesting how horses come up in so many conversations. I mean, you know, horses. I'm, I'm sure you know that. The I love horses. It's me. I, I ride for horses. For doing something stupid. I have a horse. I go riding almost every day. For doing something stupid, the Russian expression is to gallop all over Europe. Yes, gallop. Thank you very Pony much, sir. Thank, Dr. You. Dr. Thank you. Thank you for an interesting conversation. Good. Thank you. <coughs>